This is Truth Out Interviews. I'm Ted Asfragadu, and on the program is Maya Shenmar. She's the executive director at Truth Out. And Maya's working on a book on prisons in the United States, and she recently penned an article for Truth Out about uh, solitary confinement, the nature of time, and hunger strikes of nearly 30,000 California prisoners who are protesting the arbitrary and excessive solitary confinement treatment in prisons. Maya, hi. Welcome to Truth Out Interviews. Hi, Ted. It's nice to finally meet you. You too. Well, first off, why why did you want to write a book about prisons and prisoners here in the United States? For me personally, it started years ago. I had a very close friend from high school who was incarcerated before being deported from the country. And then later, I had an immediate family member, my sister, who was locked up and has continued to be incarcerated over the past few years. So there was really no way for me not to think about the topic. Um, But I think for a lot of people, when you start thinking about it, it's hard to not realize how important it is. You've got 2.3 million people incarcerated in the United States, about 7 million people in the correctional system. So that includes parole and probation. And then you've got all the people who have at some point been incarcerated or on probation. And then, and then this is such a huge population, you've got all their family members and friends and communities who are impacted by the system. So this is a huge issue that impacts a gigantic portion of the country. But it's pretty poorly covered in the media, largely because it mostly affects poor people and people of color, disenfranchised populations who don't have much sway with the media or the government, obviously. And so it becomes a really important thing that needs to be covered by independent media, like Truth Out, if it's going to be covered for real. And also for me, I guess I should say, I have a number of pen pals in prison. Um, These are people who've helped me out with stories in the past or that I've reached out to for other reasons. And sometimes a story pops up that pertains to them in particular. Um, A month ago, it was the death penalty. And then this month, um, it was the case for these guys at Pelican Bay in solitary confinement. I mean, just circling back to something that you said earlier about the number of people incarcerated, but also the families that are affected by incarceration. We... We talk about, and I think a number of the Truth Out writers have, that have been on this program have mentioned prisons um, as part of their research and a part of, as part of their writing. And, and how much, how big our prison population in the United States is relative to other countries? And it seems like what you said earlier about the numbers of people that are incarcerated and the people who are affected by those who are incarcerated It it tends to wash over the general public in terms of it's just a statistic because maybe, and I'm just supposing here, because it doesn't happen to them or it's not directly affecting them. So it just becomes a number Mm -hmm. in a sense. I mean, do you you find that when when you're researching this or you're talking to people about your project that they didn't realize some of these, these numbers, these statistics, or even, even the fact that you know, it's not just an individual or a group of individuals that are being f- affected by prison, but there's, there's a larger, if you want to call it a community, but the larger group of people that are as well. I mean, I think there's a couple of things there. One is that there are certain communities that are very aware of prisons, even if they've never been caught up in the system themselves, just because there are large numbers of people going to prison, being arrested all the time. And these are generally poor communities of color. So that awareness is a constant basic presence for a lot of people in those communities. I know even in Chicago, in North Lawndale, I think 70% of men between 18 and 49 um, are ex-offenders in the community. And that doesn't even count the people who are incarcerated. So. There, there are places where this is like really known, um, but uh, conversely, I think because the prison populations are so concentrated, there are a lot of communities where practically no one is incarcerated, and it's kind of a taboo topic to to talk about. And for me, I know like when I began having connections with the prison system, 
it was awkward. You know, people didn't want to talk about it in certain circles that, that I was involved in. And it does have this extensive impact that maybe isn't acknowledged partially because there's a sense of shame and stigma around families who are connected with the system. Um, and it's, it's funny because there's this kind of like amorphous uh, sense around acknowledging it, but it has very concrete impacts on those families and then on society as a whole. And, and one quick thing I'll mention that a lot of people don't acknowledge is there's a financial impact on families, especially since the majority of people going to prison are men who are often the people and families making the most money. And so once that person is incarcerated, regardless of how they're making money, their remaining family members are often destitute, you know, it thrown into even worse poverty than they were already in, which is usually a pretty bad state. And that has a ripple effect throughout communities. Um, so that's really important. Also, obviously, breaking up families has huge implications for the way that communities connect with each other, the way that people are able to lead their lives. And also, it falls back on public safety, ironically, when you're constantly uprooting people from their communities, putting them elsewhere. Um, maybe people are leaving those communities because of the stigma of having an incarcerated family member. Maybe the people coming back to the communities after being incarcerated can't actually live in them. There are, for example, restrictions around public housing for people who've been in prison who have a record. And so these communities get broken up in ways that actually influence crime, um, that impact crime, because you don't have that kind of neighborhood watch of that, that accountability that comes from knowing your neighbors, uh, convening as a community, that kind of thing. So I think that's important to recognize that like shooing the bad guys away isn't actually the, the thing that's going to help us in terms of public safety. You know, the, in your piece that you wrote for Truth Out, there's a kind of meditation on the on the nature of time. Uh, for those of us who aren't imprisoned, time, especially nowadays, seems to move very quickly. You know, there are days of marked about how busy we are. Sometimes we're really pulled in different directions, especially with things like social media, where we're constantly asked to update something or compelled to check something. And, and we just feel like the days go by in a bit of a blur. And we're busy with, with important things, certainly, but sometimes it's very trivial things, too. But you write about solitary confinement and solitary confinement and the nature of time, time is quite different when you have all of these things erased from your life, that you, mm -hmm. all the human contact that we tend to take for granted and sometimes find annoying is absent in solitary confinement. Maybe we could talk a little bit about that. Right. No, you've isolated. There's kind of a paradox there, right? You're, you don't have to do the things that will make you survive. <laughs> It's like the missions are taken out of life, basically. But therefore, like the point is also taken out of life. And yeah, I mean, I, I think also you nailed it down in terms of our days are filled with all these small things and scheduled time wise, not necessarily trivial things, but um, small increments. We have this series of missions to accomplish our goals, to take care of ourselves take care of others for a lot of people just to survive. And the news cycle keeps up with that fast pace multiplied. Um, obviously, the news cycle has just been moving quicker and quicker and quicker over the past few years. And in solitary, many of those time markers disintegrate and elongate. Um, the missions are gone and also other points of, of demarcation are, are not there you're thinking about the number of years between the times you've had true human contact with a family member, the number of years since a phone call. So it's different. Um, when I hear from people in the SHUs, the, the secure housing unit, solitary, they talk about all the hours over the years of staring at the wall. Um, one guy was telling me, yeah, I like finally learned how to do origami so that the wall wouldn't be so blank. 
Um, and those hours blend together. And then you've got this news item, the hunger strike, which is vitally important for them and which is being covered in the media. But we're both on the same schedule here. Ah, and so this rapid paced news cycle, which is now saying something's happening in solitary confinement. Oh, look, it's changed. You know, people are being abused without acknowledging fully that this was a reality that was ongoing in this slow, excruciating way for decades without coverage. So now it has this news peg, the strike. And the fear is how long will that last once the prisoners get some concessions, once there's some news in the other direction. And the real story here is this long, slow trudge of the prison system, especially for the people in solitary confinement. But without the flash of that news peg, um, we just move on to the next item, the next thing on our news schedule. And that happened in 2011 during the last strike. There were two hunger strikes in California about these issues. And once these reforms were implemented, which didn't do anything, they were basically like very weak band-aids, it disappeared from most media. But it still existed just as much for these people, and it was just as bad but it couldn't keep up with the tide of the news. Can we can we talk a little bit about why prisoners are thrown into solitary confinement and and why these prisoners in, were on hunger strikes against this type of treatment? So there are a number of reasons in different prisons across the country um, for why people are, are put in solitary, but it's always like a punishment. It's always a punishment after you've been sentenced. The specific stuff we're talking about in California is mostly confinement in what's called secure housing units, solitary confinement, which is very brutal, because of supposed gang affiliations. And the idea is ostensibly to break up gang members um, and keep things safe. Uh, but most of the people who are placed in these units aren't actually verifiable members of gangs, and even if you think that's a good idea to put people in gangs in these atrocious conditions, it's usually not even true. How do they, how do they know they're even in gangs? I mean, what, what tips off the prison officials that they may be in a gang or something? I mean, what... so, so what they call it um, when they're not actually in gangs, but they're still confined for gang-related reasons, is they call it um, association. They're gang associates. And Proof of association could be anything. Um, this is up to the discretion of the prison officials. So prisoners' rights literature has been used as an excuse. Possession of African-American history texts, using certain words. I mean, sometimes just exercising with a certain prisoner who has been in a gang can be enough to... W, an associate. Is, is the time frame that they're in solitary confinement arbitrary? Because it seems like some are in there for, like, you had one person in there for decades, right? I mean, I mean for, for gang affiliation or for association, that, that requires that much isolation from, from everyone else? It's, I mean, it's torture. Um, so that's actually one of their demands uh, for their hunger strike this idea of indefinite confinement. And actually, the last time that they were on hunger strike last summer, one of the concessions they got, one of the reforms, was a minimum for solitary confinement. So the minimum used to be six years, and now it's four years. But no maximum was imposed. And so you do have these people who are in for decades and don't have a hope of getting out, and, you know, at least while they're in prison. Um, of course, for those of them who are getting out of prison, what does that mean for society when you're paroled from the SHU, taken from solitary confinement, put back in society when you're traumatized, debilitated, and have no idea what to do? <laughs> That's not good for any of us. Yeah, you have no human contact, and suddenly you're thrust into, if you want to call it civilization, we're, we're thrust back into society, and you're expected just to just to adapt. But suddenly you're this person who's been isolated, you know, by force, and you have no, 
no control over it. And now you're expected to go into society and be, you know, if you want to call it a regular member, or a normal member, a, a re, you know, just like everyone else in a sense, you know, and, and, and like that never happened, but you're conditioned after years. If it's, if it's like six years in, in, in solitary confinement and suddenly they say, well, you know, either you're back in the general prison population or you're, you're going to get paroled or you're going to be out. It, it seems like what they're doing is they're conditioning them to be better prisoners so they can go back into prison. They're positioning them for prison to be their career, um, which in some ways, I mean, we talked about endangers public safety for everyone. Um, if what you're trained to do is be hopeless, be disengaged, um, be angry, be isolated, sometimes be violent, then those are conditions that you're going to bring back into your communities. Um, and I think another thing is just the sense of like punishment as a goal in and of itself that in terms of um, prisoners, we were talking about, well, people talk about prisoners in terms of oh, well, who cares how they're treated? They're getting what they deserve. It's like, all right, well, then what? You know, they even if you believe that they deserve a certain thing, what purpose does that serve? And it does go back to kind of the founding of these prisons, like when prisons became popular, when they became the primary form of punishment, as we discussed, it, it was originally this idea that, well, when you isolate people, you're putting them in a position to reflect, to think about God, to get in touch with your spirituality and realize that there must be a better way and that your obedience to God would overtake your impulses toward crime or to evil. Um, and obviously, solitary confinement didn't work that way. And that goal kind of fell off and the punitive goal remained and it doesn't have any kind of end purpose for anyone. It's just basically at this point, torture. People in general, it, they, it's difficult for them to have sympathy for prisoners because if you go to prison, chances are you committed some crime so bad that it necessitated you to be, uh, you know, to be taken out of society and put into an isolated place, whether it's a general prison population or whether it's solitary confinement. So people are jailed be so they, because they've committed a crime. So suddenly they have that mark that they are a criminal. And it's very difficult for people to feel like, why should, you know, why should I have sympathy for the plight of prisoners? Why should I be concerned about their treatment when they themselves uh, individually acted in a horrendous way, quite possibly. And, um, and there's, there's that sense that they're getting what they deserved, if not more. And so when, when you write about prisons and people that have come before you and certainly will come after you and write about prisons and are talking about these conditions, what does this really say about our society and how, why, why should we care as, as a society about what goes on in prisons, especially like with solitary confinement and other types of treatment? I mean, I think one thing kind of overarching, and then I'll talk more specifically to think about is what you and I have really been discussing is like a systemic thing. It's prisons fundamentally not working the way they are right now. And so even if you have no sympathy whatsoever for prisoners, um, even if you remove sympathy from the equation, when it comes down to it, lots of people who are reassured by the idea of prison are fundamentally wrong. <laughs> you know, um, the bad guys aren't, aren't staying away and it's not preventing uh, violence and it's certainly not preventing the kinds of things that perpetuate um, negative phenomena in our society. Like prison is is not a solution. Um, I think coming back to the idea of guilt and the idea of getting what you deserve, it, it's, it's funny because there are all different reasons why people land in prison. And for some people, simply being black or brown or poor is enough of a crime to get you in prison for something that someone who's middle class and white would, would never get in prison for, would never get in trouble for. And so things like small drug crimes, minor theft, um, most of the time people are 
uh, incarcerated for nonviolent offenses. And the way that prison affects their lives, both during and after their incarceration, this punitive system really massively impacts their existence and puts them in this position of struggling even more. And so it could be very sympathetic in these common scenarios if, if you think of those backstories um, and why people end up there. And oftentimes people are going to prison because of their background and how they look and their identity as opposed to being a danger to society. But in terms of people who are classified as dangerous, and I think that, you know, a lot of the prisoners in Pelican Bay, the reason they're there is because they've been determined to be dangerous because they've committed a violent crime. Um, and... I think like you, you can think about it in terms of the functioning of the system, and you can also think about it as a human rights issue. So in terms of the fun functioning of the system, if people are committing violent crimes, they're hurt people, hurt people, hurt people, right? So you're putting them in this position where they're more distanced, more angry, more hopeless, and then that punishment goes on to affect what they do next and the impact they have on, on people on the outside, even while, while inside of prison. Secondarily, in terms of solitary confinement beyond the system not working, these are very stark human rights violations. When I characterize it, people say, you know, cruel and unusual punishment, dehumanization, medieval torture, the way that people who get this label are all of a sudden not human and you can do whatever you want to them. These people are being treated worse than animals. And we have to look at ourselves and say, what kind of society do we want to live in if we allow human beings, because they're still human, to be treated in this way? And also, what are we getting out of it? Um, how do we think that this punishment is going to further our society, is going to make us safer, and how abusing and traumatizing people could ever be a positive thing for the country and the world? What does it do for us? I think we're going to leave it there. Uh, Maya, I want to thank you for being on the program and uh, talking to us about, uh, about the, this project that you're working on, and we get a taste of it on, on Truth Out in terms of the, the article that you penned. And you do have a number of interviews with prisoners that you've done, and that is also posted on Truth Out. That's correct, right? Those interviews are done by the Center for Constitutional Rights. So the prisoners that I quote in my column this month and last month, that's a separate thing. That's, that's my correspondence. But yeah, this latest Pelican Bay series, we're actually um, taking the words of prisoners, and those are directly posted to the site. And this is all leading to a book, which is probably going to come out in a year or so? Yeah. The book is actually not about solitary confinement in particular. Um, the book is about the relationships between prisoners and folks on the outside and the relationship between prison and society on the outside. So it's a slightly different focus, but these issues definitely figure in. Do you have a title yet? I'm going back and forth so much that I don't even want to say anything. All right. Well, when it comes out, of course, we'll we'll have you back on and we'll have the official title and we can talk more in depth about that. Sounds good. Maya Shanwar, she is the executive director of Truth Out and as we've been talking about prisons uh, and she's currently uh, in the process of writing a book about this uh, in a larger context. Make sure you read uh, Maya's work, share it with your social networks, and subscribe to this channel because we do these interviews roughly once a week, sometimes every other week. I just want to thank you again, Maya, for being on the program and thank you for watching Truth Out Interviews. I'm Ted Asfragadu. We'll see you next time.